everybody to uh, this uh, week's materials. Today we will be talking about a lot of things. Um, and before we begin, I just want to clarify that uh, there are topics that are, by definition, very deeply interconnected in psychology. So you might find other courses where each of the topics that we'll be discussing today has its own separate module, its own separate week. But I thought that because of the interconnectedness that they have, that they share, it's a good idea to present them all at once, especially because last week in the previous one, we discussed neurotransmitters, we discussed um, pharmacology, we discussed some elements of uh, psychiatric diagnostics. And so the next step is to discuss emotion, stress, stress response, addiction, and overall health. So that's what we're going to discuss today. And it's also a bridge week, a bridge module to what we will be discussing next week, which has to do with personality and psychotherapy. Without further ado, let's begin. Now, one question that a lot of people ask is related to the usual mind versus body connection, nature versus nurture. More specifically, why do we behave the way we do? Why do we feel the way we do? Why do we think the way we do? Is it something to do with our brain, with nature, with a genetic makeup, or is it something that we learn by exposure to things, situation, and people? A good way to answer this question today is to look at emotions from a very broad perspective. So let's assume that you can have only three main emotions. Now, you might remember this from a previous uh, discussion we had in the introductory module to this course. So some of the things that I will be sharing now will really be connected to week one and week two. So let's start with these three basic emotions. Let's assume that you can have very happy emotions. Okay. Then you might have something like neutral emotions. And then right here, you might have some very sad emotions, okay? Now, this is a very common description that we utilize when we talk about addiction and recovery in general. Now, of course, this is an oversimplification of human emotions. There are many more than three, obviously, but this gives us a good chance to start a conversation. So let's assume that we can divide this somewhat equally, all right? So we will use, let's see, uh, a separation, okay, between these three emotions, okay? So you have happy, neutral, and sad. As I mentioned before, neutral stands for neuter, so neither of these two, but there might be some level of transition. So let's assume also that if we could create some sort of a pendulum, okay, the pendulum will start right here. Okay? And this should definitely sound familiar to you. Okay? So this is a pendulum that swings back and forth between the two opposites, right? Either right here or right here, swinging back and forth. So in the example that I previously discussed with you, the pendulum might go right here, right? have an oscillatory movement toward your left side, okay? And this means that I am slightly happier, okay? This might happen, for instance, if you receive a good news, you pass a test, you graduated, you can refer to some memory apparatus, first kiss, new house, new building, new friends, anything that's happy will make you go up here, okay? with the assumption that eventually you will go back to baseline after a certain period, okay? The opposite happens if you're right here, okay, where your sadness increases, okay? So this could be the bad news that you received this morning, it may be connected to some element of positive memories, sorry, negative memories, such as, I don't know, 
you had a car accident or you missed the bus or the person who you consider your best friend never responds to your uh, phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. The assumption, of course, is that after a while, you go back to baseline. Okay. Now, here is the thing. Let's assume that some of these emotions can be artificially induced and some are simply experienced. Okay? So you can get happy if something happens to you that you did not expect, a gift. Okay? You can be sad if something happens to you that you did not expect, a car accident. Okay? But then there are things that make you more or less happy or sad. Now, since we discussed psychopharmacology, you might remember from the previous conversation that you do have things that will boost your mood and things that will decrease your mood. Things that will boost your activity overall, your psychophysical activity, and things that will lower your physical or physiological activity and psychological components to it. You have mood stabilizer in between, but you have uppers, so to speak, and downers. Okay? So for instance, okay, while happy and sad are broad term for something that we'll discuss is much more complicated, you could assume there are things that will motivate you more and things that will make you less motivated. Example, if you drink a lot of coffee or stimulants in general, you might be up here, okay? If you uh, drink a lot of depressants, you might be up here, so, or down here, okay? Now, we need to understand that there is a separation between chemistry and personal subjective experience. For instance, among depressants, you can think of alcohol, right? But it does not necessarily mean that in the moment, as you drink alcohol, you feel sad or more, more, more deprived of your emotions, okay? You might feel the opposite, but eventually, what you build up is more and more sadness, okay? Or the opposite is true with coffee. You think you might feel happier in the moment, if you remember the discussion we had about Peter Bregan and psychopharmacology, but eventually, after a while, you feel more jittery, you feel more stress, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an oversimplification. Now, if you do remember from week one, I also mentioned this, that this pendulum can move right here on the left side or right here to the right side. So for instance, let's assume that we are talking about coffee. And if you remember the conversation about adenosine and the... And the uh, circadian rhythm, you know that one of the negative side effects of high coffee consumption is lack of sleep, anxiety, and so on, okay? And the uh, problematic uh, correlation to uh, neural receptors. So if you drink coffee and you never drank it before, you might have this experience. It's not quite happiness, okay? You could not necessarily define as happiness, but you're very active, okay? You're very motivated, okay? And so you might be more prone to do things that will eventually create this positive loop. I have more energy. I do more things. I feel good about doing things that are positive, And therefore, I feel more positive overall. This connects psychopharmacology, neuroscience, and conditioning. Okay? So you might feel that there is a delta, let's say, angle here. Okay? And it's not quite the same, let's say, this gamma angle here. Okay? but you're still going in the same direction. The opposite happens, of course, if you go on this direction because you, you took, I don't know, a uh, anxiolytic, right? So you feel less anxious, okay? You feel less uh, all over the place, kind of speaking, but you also feel a little more de-energized. Not quite sad, there is a difference here, okay? But less motivated. The last thing I mentioned is that as you do this, eventually your system will build up whatever we want to uh, call it, resiliency, stability, uh, absorption, and the opposite, withdrawal, more craving, et cetera, et cetera. I use these terms in a broader sense. We discuss them more specifically in psychopharmacology. In the end though, as soon as you are absorbing a certain amount of energy or chemicals that will lead to the consequence a consequential um, reaction, then you need to move the pendulum right here, okay, to have the same effect. So with the same angle, I transpose the pendulum here, okay, at this point, you need to have the more amount to feel the same level of happiness, okay. Eventually, if the pendulum goes up here, okay, you might feel very, very happy, but at this point, we're no longer talking about happiness, 
because the brain can no longer sustain these levels of overstimulation. So rather than talking about happiness and overall balanced positive feelings, we might start talking of mania, okay, or hypomania, okay? And the opposite here, okay, the more you push one end, the more the system tries to push back to rebalance the overall system. So at this point, trying to push this back, you will feel the same and opposite amount of sadness at baseline, okay? So this pendulum is a metaphor, of course, but what really indicates both in physiological terms, psychopharmacological terms, and experiential terms is that there is a limit that the brain, that your body allows you to play with before the opposite reaction occurs. So you cannot necessarily fake happiness or quote unquote fake sadness until you reach a certain plateau. Okay? And this is really neurobiologically constructed. Now, how does this apply to stress and health? Well, in terms of addiction, as the name implies, it's something that you are uh, building up in a sequence that makes you more prone to repeat a certain behavior. So to oversimplify things here, if one were to define our predisposition for addiction, let's say addiction to coffee or alcohol, as I mentioned in this example, okay? If we were to define it, okay, addiction, okay, you might find that there are several things attached to it, okay? So I would say that here we might call it nature, okay, nature, and here you might find it nurture, okay? with some caveats here. Nature, it's not static, it changes. If you remember, we discussed about um, um, neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. And nurture, it's not necessarily only about learning, okay? It makes a big part of it, but it's not everything that is connected to the learning process. So addiction in terms of nature, okay, really means neurotransmission, okay, chemistry, or substance you use, okay, and um, function and structure, let's say, okay, on a neural level, okay, what type of response mechanism you have. In terms of nurture, okay, of course, I would say the top should be learning, and conditioning, okay? We can be conditioned to drink more, okay? Whether it's alcohol or coffee, in that sense, it doesn't really matter. We're talking about uh, stimulus and response. We are also talking about what? We're talking about uh, the, the way we play a role, okay? So in terms of punishment and reinforcement, okay? So go back to uh, week four and five. Nurture also means exposure, okay? Not in a sense of psychotherapy for traumatic events, which is we will discuss that next week, but exposure in terms of observing behavior, right? Repetition of behavior. And this, in turn, is connected to what we said about um, uh, sociocognitive theory, Albert Bandura, right? Okay. And and Bandura, sorry, okay, and CBT, okay, cognitive behavioral therapy, the cognitive triad, right? The fact that you have your emotion, your action, and your cognition as a triangle that keeps influencing one another. So the way you behave, the way you think, and the way you feel all play a role in the nurture part, which makes things even more complex. Because if you think about the reason why we become addicted to certain things is to a big extent predisposition, nature, okay, the way we are born. And even in that sense, the line here is a dotted line because uh, there's a lot of studies that, that appear to indicate that even nature can be affected across generation by the way we were uh, interacting in our close family circle and extended family circle. So it's not really one versus the other. 
But on top of that, you have experiential analysis, which means interpretation of what's going around there, which in turn means that some people might be more prone to smoke, for instance, a cigarette, if everybody around them smokes, and some people might uh, obtain, neurocognitively speaking, the opposite result. They're so disgusted by uh, seeing this smoking around them, they will never smoke in their life. Okay, um, So there's a lot of explanation to it, but a good explanation is also what we know from research. And some of the interesting research also indicates that even if we can point out to a very specific things at the level of, let's say, chemistry, neurotransmitters, and, 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 and neuroreceptors, we are still in charge. Uh, there are many examples to that. Um, one example um, is those is represented by those studies that involve adrenaline and adrenaline attached to uh, overstimulation, but also to some level attachments. For instance, there are studies that indicate that uh, we might be more prone to perceive things a certain way if we are um, we are under the assumption that we uh, are having some extra level of adrenaline. Example, if uh, uh, a study subject is asked to watch a movie, okay, and this movie might be, I don't know, a comedy movie or a movie that it's, you know, for lack of better terms, fun to watch, okay, um, or a person is asked to watch a horror movie, okay, and these subjects in these two groups um, are being asked to uh, think about what the research study is um, expecting them to do, then the, their answer will be also predicated on this instruction. Another similar study is when a person is under the under the belief that they received some extra chemicals, so they will react appropriately because of this piece of information. Okay? Now, I mentioned adrenaline because adrenaline is being connected with these enhancements of, um, of behavioral uh, components, but it's also not just about uh, intensity on its own, but it's also connected to things such as emotion. Example, you might have studies that are completely, um, or they seem to be completely separate from what adrenaline is supposed to do, and yet the person might be experiencing more things that are attached to other behavioral patterns. So a study might uh, give the false impression that what they're studying is uh, physical strength, but what really are uh, recording is uh, romantic predisposition. Another study might indicate they're, uh, I don't know, um, researching digestive processes, just to mention what we said uh, in regard to um, uh, Ivan Pavlov, and yet a completely different uh, outcome is revealed. So there's a lot of things to uh, keep in mind. All right, so this also means that, as we will see in the uh, remaining part of this lecture, whatever happens to us in terms of nature should not prevent us from developing a healthier sense of self. The sky is the limit, so to speak, both in terms of practical application, you can change yourself for the better, but also in a spiritual and theological uh, perspective or, or uh, viewpoint, because you need to strive for something beyond yourself. Now, one of the essential elements to this is thinking about what uh, psychologists such as uh, Abraham Maslow have to say about the pyramid of human needs. Um, and we will discuss that more next week, but overall having a purpose, a meaning in life in itself is a grounding factor for the amelioration of psychophysiological elements. So there is an element of belief that will change physically the way we interact in the world. Now, a problematic element with the belief in oneself is that we ourselves are not the good in a higher sense um, determinant or characteristic of what makes life healthier or otherwise, okay? We will embark on this uh, conversation next week, but for the time being, think of it like this way. In this scheme, I talk only about addiction, okay? But this can be substituted with many other things uh, in psychology. So addiction, we could think of strong emotions, uh, depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. I created this diagram as if everything was half and half, half nature, half nurture, but those things do fluctuate. 
while we cannot directly attack nature in many cases, not in all cases, because of course you do have biological medical elements, and I would say that psychopharmacology would definitely qualify as nature and change the chemistry after all, but it's less likely we can impact this directly. There's a lot of more room for us to activate our positive response in nature, okay? sorry, nurture. What does that mean, Fred? It means that we do have several emotional responses to the way we uh, go about life, but we can decide how we will respond to those stimuli. Okay? Never underestimate the ability you have to make not necessarily your life as a whole better, but yourself better. Okay? Now, the question remains, how can we know what is good and bad in that sense? Because what we feel in the moment is good for us or bad for us might not in the long run be what is really good for us or bad for us. So another psychological component to this discussion is separating our wants, okay, our wants versus our needs, okay? I talked about this a little bit in week one, but the general idea is that we also need experience. We need experience in a neurodevelopmental sense. We cannot know what's good for us when we're not developmentally ready. Classical example, the uh, relation between our limbic system and our higher cortical function, the prefrontal cortex. So a five-year-old does not know what is good for her or him as much as a 45 year old person, for instance, okay? And also beyond neurodevelopmental elements, okay? We also need to learn based on experience with people, things, and situations, okay? So your question may be, okay, I understand that addiction, as an example, is both nature and nurture, and the fact that we are masters of our own responses to a very big extent, even if there is an element of um, biological component, but what about emotions in general? What causes emotions? Are emotions universal? Are they innate or not? And the answer is also in between. So let's try to target uh, emotions in general. Are we our masters in that sense? Well, we do yet. So the question is, to what extent do you react? So I will give you some examples here, okay? Now, keep in mind that emotions, as mentioned multiple times, have to do with a movement, right? In Latin, okay, you're, you're moving, okay, from a place. I've been moved to empathy, to sympathy. I mean, moved to anger, et cetera, et cetera, to joy, right? So this movement should happen in a sequence. So let's assume that, for instance, you could have the classical example, stimulus, okay, stimulus and response. That is the intuitive way to describe emotions, right? Let's assume you see uh, a big bear in the woods, okay, and you experience, let's say, fear, okay? This is very intuitive and seems to be pretty straightforward. Of course, I will experience fear if I see a bear uh, in the woods. Is this always the case? Well, let's try to tackle nature at first. So where is fear in the brain? Three, two, one. Yes, that's the correct answer. Well, I hope you, you have the correct answer. So you could blame, so to speak, fear on several brain areas. The amygdala. Okay. Because of the fight and fly response, right? Is that all? Well, fear is also the ability to recognize something that we previously experienced as fearful. So there's some element of memory, right? So you might also blame it on the hippocampus, okay? Okay about memory, okay? And you might say, well, wait a second, but fear is also me understanding that I'm afraid. So, okay, we can add the 
uh, prefrontal cortex here, okay? Prefrontal cortex, okay? But what, what about the bear itself? The fact that I've seen the bear, I need to have some stimulus that the brain perceives as such. Okay, so you assume that you've seen the bear. So where do you see things? Well, you might consider that are the occipital lobe, okay? You might have some element of sensory motor perception or at, at the very least somatosensory apparatus, the sense of pain, okay? And you might start to sweat as well. So you might have certain things that have to do directly with the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system, okay? As well as the parietal lobe, okay? And yet you might have heard something that sounds like a bear. So you have the temporal lobe, which is also activated, okay? So you have multiple areas, but the idea is that bear is position A, okay? So this starts first, and fear is in position B. So in other words, the bear causes fear. I am afraid because I've seen a bear, okay? Now, sure, you might argue, okay, this doesn't explain the emotion at all because there is an interaction between these two, okay? Let's do it with a dotted line. And the interaction here could be interpretation. Interpretation. What does that mean? It means that I might or might be not correct about my assumption. Maybe it was not a bear. It was just someone walking in the woods going for a hike. And we interpret that as a threat where the truth was just maybe an old uh, couple just walking, taking a stroll to see the beautiful poly season in Vermont. So we'd be wrong about our bear. And so this means, okay, if I know that this was not a bear, but it was just maybe leaves, okay, leaves, does that mean that there is no fearful response well, the answer should be informed by our neuroscience, which means that once you already have some level of false interpretation, okay, even if you know that you have no reason to fear, because again, we're not talking about a big animal, but just leaves, okay, you already have a skyrocket um, activation that will make your response not completely balanced, not completely calm. In practice, what is this? Well, in terms of neuroscience, we're talking about action potentials, of course, action potential and spikes. Okay? So there is an activation, but you also have, you can write here, a physiological response. Physiological response. Okay? How do we know that? How do we measure that in psychology? Well, with things such as cortisol level, okay? So if we monitor our cortisol level, cortisol level, before position A, and then after position B, and we see that there is an enhancement, okay, of that, then we might add something else to it. And where do we add this explanation uh, of the fact that despite the fact that I know that it's not the case. I still feel somewhat an overactivation of my fear mechanism. Well, this is where we blame, so to speak, or we attribute the resulting factor to the HPA axis, hypothalamus pituitary um, adrenal axis, okay? Which again adds one more factor here, okay? As the name implies, the hypothalamus, okay? Hypo balance. And this is not really surprising because you are all wonderful neuroscientists and you know that the hypothalamus, together with the pituitary gland, is the center mechanism, the center uh, control of our brain. And this is also true, okay? Now, other studies obviously indicate that the, the, the level of cortisol is to some big extent also predicated upon information. So in other words, while some stress-induced response is still present, even though you know that you're safe, okay, 
then this response is magnified if we have confirmation that yes that is indeed a pair okay so the separation between the truth and the false interpretation and misinterpretation is what uh characterizes the trauma response think of ptsd for instance the person experienced trauma and this person is in a safe place there is some level of remaining uh physiological response that might make the person more stressed despite the fact that they don't have any rational reason to be stressed okay which is extremely essential to the discussion we're having today we talk about emotion health um addiction um and the stress response when we talk about safe spaces safe places we have to be extremely careful because from a physiological uh perspective we can be our worst enemies we can literally attract trauma in this sense now this might be quite confusing to you because you might say well wait a second you just said that there are different level of cortisol level uh, cortisol levels pun intended uh but after all the information goes always from a to b okay so there always is a reason to be afraid maybe not as big as we thought before leaves but there's always this sequence, this direction. And you might be surprised because in a lot of cases, the opposite is true. So let's see how that would work. There are some, some um, research scientists that would agree that the direction, it's not from A to B, but from B to A. So let's simplify things here, okay? So we are trying to understand what we can say about let me put it this way feeling safe okay you're talking about emotion okay versus let's say feeling threat okay? yes i do understand that there's more to it than just this two simplified notion but this is what we're trying to understand so in the first example you have bear okay and then fear Okay. A and B. But is it possible that we go from fear to fear? That's the question. Is this possible? Does that make sense? Well, if you look at it like that, it does not make sense because unless you want to take into account some esoteric manifestation, your fear itself will not manifest. A bear coming up to you okay? and i leave this esoteric uh, transcendental consideration aside this is of course in the science of psychology not in in uh, um occult esotericism something like that but let's see what these two represent in practice okay? so from our perspective from the perspective of research bear really means information okay info okay info and maybe stimulus okay stimulus okay Okay. And fear would mean physiological response. Okay. Physiological response. Okay. In other words, it doesn't matter what is the thing that makes us afraid. We're talking about something that occurs with our senses. Okay. And at this level, we can say our senses directly, okay, our five senses. Okay. Five senses or our senses plus uh let's say uh cortical or subcortical interpretation okay okay we see something and we interpret that visual stimulus as something we might or might not know okay i see the light i can interpret that as the sun or as the uh, effect of a light switch in a room okay so stimulus our five senses and information as choreo interpretation physiological response pretty straightforward we are talking about fear for clarity to give an example so you might think about i don't know you might start to sweat okay uh your heart rate uh will increase uh you must start to clench your fist um etc etc okay so we have certain physiological response cortisol you already mentioned that okay cortisol level okay but I'll put this in parentheses and you'll see why. 
So if this is the case, okay, going from here to there will simply mean the opposite from uh, physics, right? The response, physics, okay, to uh, information, okay? So what does that mean in practice? Well, in terms of physics, okay, if you remember physics is the nature, the body, something that's physical, right? So in this interpretation of why we feel fear, what happens first is our increase in heart rate, we start to sweat, okay? Something happens in our body, we might feel tense, we might feel a pressure in our chest, something is telling us that something is not wrong. Some of the things might be straightforward interpreted because you feel that you're sweating, you feel you're clenching your fists, and some things might be half hidden, okay? You're, you might not be able to monitor your heart rate in the moment, but you feel your heart pounding, okay? And there are certain things that are hidden from consciousness, okay? They may be subconscious or preconscious. You cannot monitor your cortisol level, but you nevertheless experience all the physiological response in your body. And because you feel tense and sweaty and, and, and under pressure, at this level, then you interpret that as, huh, that's fear, okay? Or, huh, I need to do something about that, etc. okay? So those are two interpretations. There are many others in the psychology of emotions, but you can tell how those are things that we should view in a holistic way, in an interconnected way. I might experience fear as a result of a stimulus, but I can also tell myself to speak that I am afraid because of my physiological response. So those things are interpreted as two intelligences. One, you could say cortical uh, based on interpretation, higher uh, cognitive function, and the other one for physiological, more uh, limbic system related um, um, presentation. Okay? So this does not fully answer the question, but helps us shed some light on this. What does it mean to feeling safe and feeling threatened? It also means that we do, for this way, we do attract things, okay? Attract things in life. Now, I don't say this lightly because, I, again, I don't want to give you a false impression that um, that you should have a I don't know, magical outlook in life uh, by which you interpret everything as an indication that you have I don't know, magical powers to attract good things and bad things in life. But if, uh, if we want to look at this from a scientific perspective, you can see how the things you start to consider as important, okay, or interesting, okay, interesting, okay, will also be viewed as a stimulus, okay? And since we talked about stimuli so many times in the semester, you can, at the very least, look at them as positive or negative stimuli, okay? So in other words, we become, to some extent, part of what we're trying to avoid. This is extremely important in psychology. Example, uh, this could be also an implicit bias. For instance, if you are a, um, if you're in the medical profession, you might be more prone to notice risk factor in comparison to the average person. So you might be uh, starting from more stressed point of view because you're preparing for the worst, okay? So you might see things that are otherwise considered to be normal or not threatening, but you are more in tune with what you need to do to solve the problem, okay? So uh, this is kind of a classical example of uh, if you give a, a child a hammer, everything needs to be hammered down, okay? You the predisposition of, of finding problems or things to be fixed uh, when the other person might not see anything, okay? This is not necessarily a bad things overall. Uh, it's really the, the, the primary things that is be behind all possible jobs, okay? If you are a mechanic, 
you should see problems in the car that the average person might not see, okay? Because otherwise you're not a good mechanic. If you are um, a wood carpenter, you should know what to look for if the overall construction, let's say a wooden roof, it's not perfect, okay? Because this might create more problems. But as you can see here, you might actually add too much emphasis to the point that you might overreact to some things. Think about uh, being too, how can I say this? Too morally strict and entitled where you see the whole world as sinful, bad, morally um, destructing, um, ethically improper, et cetera. You blame everyone. You're looking for situations to point fingers at others. You're overstressed about things that you need to be fixing because otherwise the whole world will collapse. So unless you have everything perfect according to your own self-judgment, then you feel more stressed. So you might start from a good point, a good and balanced uh, area in your heart, but you might be overreacting to things. So the same way as if you have a hammer, you see all things that need to be hammering down, okay? Um, if you have a glue as a metaphor, you think of all the things that are, you know, could use some glue to be reattached. If you look for problems, sins, mistakes, hatred, you will find all of this, even the other person or the other group of people might not be aware of it or might not have the same intent. And this is exactly this. For instance, if you might have a traumatic experience, you may see every situation as traumatic, okay? Despite the fact that the other person does not perceive them as such. So you might try to create a world where you can feel safe in all situations, but you will find that you have this discrepancy between what you want and what the world is presenting to you, which is, again, one of the core problems in psychology is the discrepancy between the way things are and the way things ought to be. Okay, So let's add this discrepancy between the way, the way things are okay and the way things ought to be okay so this preference okay? and the more separation you have between these two things the more stress you will perceive okay so if you remember, I mentioned uh, this in week two, I believe, uh, from uh, uh, Rumi, the Persian poet, either you are attempting to cover the whole surface of the world with carpets, with rugs, so that you don't want to hurt yourself, or you put on a pair of shoes. Okay? So these studies on emotion help us understand that regardless of the external or internal circumstances, nature and nurture, there's a lot of things we can do to start feeling safe again, not being threatened all the time. Okay? It's extremely important. If you're too extreme in one area, you might be too gullible, too naive to the point that you don't understand the threats the world presents to you, okay? And neurologically speaking, we see that in the underactivation of the amygdala, which is also a problem with uh, PTSD. But if you see everything about the world as a threat, you will increase the likelihood that you experience more stress, more physiological and psychological issues, and ultimately, you will create a nightmare for yourself, okay? So this answers the first question here, the difference between feeling safe and feeling threatened is again about feelings. Okay, so it can start from a stimulus, the bear, okay, to a feeling, to a response, okay, fear, okay, but it can also be the opposite. We might interpret or misinterpret what the stimulus is actually telling us. So this is the first, okay, and that's why I mentioned here important and interesting, okay. Um, interesting means to be in between, right? As inter plus 
S in Latin, okay? Interest pretty straightforward. S is to be, okay? So we make something real if we think, if we feel, and we act upon as if those things were real. So if we don't want to find safe spaces in life, we will create unsafe spaces because we always look for the negative, okay? And this will be connected to cognitive distortions, as we will see next week. So this is the first part of the uh, um, answer. The second part is, okay, assuming that stress and health and all these are connected, how about emotions themselves, okay? If we talk about emotions, are there some elements of truth in claiming that are universal and innate or not, okay? We will see that there are certain emotions that if not universal or in, innate as such, will determine universally valid physiological responses, okay? So, in other words, there are things that might make me happy or make me sad or make me angry, and those things will be different from the next person, okay? I might be happy about a vanilla cake. The other person might feel, well, it's okay, but it's not really something that makes me particularly happy. I may be very angry about uh, what person A told me and person C might say, well, it's just fine or just joking, okay? So those things might be subjective, but the physiological response, okay, might be more common. So physiological response as a facial, for instance, facial expression, okay? Now we did, uh, mentioned something along the lines of physiological response when we discuss fear, clenching fists, for instance, all right? This is a physiological response, but it might not be necessarily universal in that sense, but facial expression appears to have a lot of indication that that is the case. And if the question is, uh, how, how many of these uh, facial expressions are universal? Okay, how do I know that this means happy? This means... I don't know, sad or concerned, this means angry or something like that. Well, we could say that there are six plus one universal facial expressions, okay? And uh, six plus one because the one represent contempt, okay? And something that is, I would say, not as universal as the previous six, uh, and one of the most important researchers in this area is Paul Ackman. Okay? So we, we will discuss this next. So those are the emotions or the universal facial expressions according to Paul Ackman. Again, the question is, how many are there? Are there six or seven? As I mentioned, contempt is the one that was added you know, in a different uh, part of his research. But as you can see here, uh, anger, disgust, enjoyment or joy or happiness, fear, sadness, and surprise appear to be something that every person, regardless of uh, socioeconomic status, cultural frameworks, beliefs or lack thereof, appear to display in very, very similar ways. And this should tell us something about how profoundly constructed such emotions are, how innate they are. And of course, this is always something to do with the old debate between nature and nurture. But again, it's something that also makes us human in the deeper sense of the term. We can all relate to, uh, to this. And of course, uh, Paul Ekman is one of the most important researchers in these areas. But again, th there's a lot, of, a lot of things that we can say about it. Well, the first thing is that there are multiple theories of emotions. And among the most interesting thing is that if those emotions, as Paul Ekman describes, are universal, the question would be, so are, are these emotions expressed exactly the same way? So is it something that we can recognize as such regardless of our education, for instance? And this is, beside Paul Ackman, something that Carol uh, Izzard also suggested. Uh, Carol Izzard suggests actually there were 10 emotions, okay? So you, you, you don't have only these six or seven, but you have uh, more emotions, okay? And, and in fact, she added contempt, shame, and guilt, okay? 
Um, and those will qualify as 10 basic emotions. But in any case, joy, anger, uh, disgust, surprise, sadness, fear are the ones that uh, really uh, disgust represents uh, our um, overall, um, overall human experience. Now, since we mentioned Paul Ekman and we mentioned uh, Carol Izzard, is there anything else uh, beyond this universal emotions? What kind of other models we have? And in the next slide, we can see that there are multiple models. So I mentioned already going from point A to point B, um, but those are some of the most important in the history of modern psychology because they're cited everywhere. So you have the Cannon-Bard model, um, you have the James Lange model, you have the Schachter-Singer model, also general reasoning model, okay? And then the Schachter-Singer two-factor model, right? So instead of having event, arousal, reasoning, and emotion, you have event, arousal, cognitive labels, and emotions. What, what else can we say about, about this? Well, uh, there are a few things that we can say. So starting from, from the James Lange theory, okay? And this is one of the precursors of modern, uh, modern psychology because by James Lange, we, we, this dates back to, to uh, uh, William James, okay? So late 1800, okay? So one of the most important facts about the James Lange theory is that our emotions uh, are connected to consciousness. Emotions are our conscious awareness of our physiological responses to stimuli, okay? So our body arousal happened first in other, in other, in other uh, terms. Instead, the canon bar theory uh, is a theory that asserts that we have a conscious or cognitive experience, we should separate this, of an emotion simultaneously. So at the same time as our body is responding, not afterwards. So our, our body, our body intelligence, our human body response uh, runs parallel to the way we think about it, okay? Rather than being the cause, okay? So emotions are not just a separate mental experience. When our body responses are blocked, emotions do not feel as intense. So our cognitive processes will influence the way we react emotionally um, because this is connected to the interpretation. So how does that separate or at least different from the two-factor theory? Well, in this theory, emotions do not exist until we add a, a uh, interpretation, a label, to the sensation we're ex experiencing, right? So the subjects interpret their agitation, their changing in mood, their fear, to the emotion others in the room appear to be feeling, right? So there is some sort of halo. The emotional label is spilled over from others. And this is actually interesting because it was a study done by uh, Schachter and Singer back in the 60s, I think it was 1961 or 62, and this was called the spillover effect. So we are empathetic beings. We interpret emotions on the basis of other other people um, going through the same the same um, experience, really. Okay. So uh, and and again, you need to keep in mind that there are different types of labels we use in psychology. We have emotions in general connected to feelings, right? And then you have arousal, behavior, and cognition. So to give an example, if you have this behavior is expressed, this expressed behavior, um, it's something that is out there, like raising your voice, um, clenching your fist, um, yelling, okay, raising your voice. And then you have physiological states, bodily arousal, such as the, the example I gave earlier, like when you, when you sweat or your, your heart rate increases, pounding heart, okay? And then you have this conscious experience, okay, uh, that labels it. This will be very important when we discuss uh, next week personality and psychotherapy. The way we label our emotions really determine who we are as people, okay? It's not the only thing, but really creates um, a, an interpretation that we use to go about life in many, many different aspects, okay? So this is a very, very important thing. There is one more that I did not include in, the, in this slide, the Zayonk uh, Ledoux uh, theory of emotion, okay? And, and this, um, it's, it's pretty much a, a type of theory that discusses emotions without, without uh, this, uh, this level of awareness or, or cognition. So you, you, the, explan the main explanation is that you have this instant um, uh, observation before cognitive appraisal. And for instance, it's an automatic 
reaction, you can say reacting to a stimulus, like a sound, right? Like in the example I give you about the bird, reacting to a sound uh, in, the, in the woods before upraising it, okay? So this is uh, this instinctual, we could say, uh, almost model, like immediate model. And there's also the Lazarus uh, theorem of uh, emotion, uh, which is judgment, appraisal. Is this something I should be afraid or not, okay? And this sometimes happens with a level of enhanced awareness, sometimes not. Uh, and then this gives us a sense of uh, inner peace if, if this is something that, that uh, calms us down, so to speak. Okay, So some emotional reactions, and especially the strong ones, the fears, the, 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 the things we like or we do not like, they kind of develop in a, in a uh, lower sense, in lower pathway, lower road through the brain. Okay? So they kind of skip conscious thought. Okay? And, and this is especially true if we think about the study of... Uh, the fight and flight response and uh, the, the function of, of the amygdala in response to uh, specific uh, images. Okay? And, um, and so you, could, you can imagine this as having an event, a triggering event, and this event determined the, our, the appraisal and then the emotional response in the Lazarus or Schachter Singer theory, and the event goes straight to the emotional response in the Zayong Ledoux um, theory of emotion. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different things that uh, we can uh, we can uh, see about that. But at the same time, it, it's kind of the chicken and the egg problem. But as long as you remember the, this term, the, this this labeling, this this appraisal, the, the cognition, the the expressive uh, behavior, then you have a sound grasp on what emotions are and. Uh, on top of that, uh, we, we mentioned embodied cognition in week uh, two and three. There's also an embodied emotion, so an emotion that's rooted in our body, okay? So it explains the role of the autonomic nervous system. So the, the physiological arousal felt during these emotions is monitored, modulated, orchestrated by the sympathetic nervous system, which, as you know, trigger activity and changes in various organs. And so uh, you have body signs, uh, you have emotional expressions, and this also allows us to detect emotions in others. This is essential to understand mirror neurons. Mirror neurons is one of the most fundamental research uh, studies uh, ever uh, conducted in neuroscience, um, and it's a study by uh, Giacomo Rizzolatti in, in Italy, probably uh, the uh, leading uh, neuroscientific authority in the understanding of, I would say, almost everything uh, between neuroscience and psychology when it comes to understanding cognitive processes, emotional processes, behavioral processes. And the idea is that we monitor our lives on the observation, sometimes subconscious observation of others. That's why we call them mirror neurons. Okay? They are mirror neurons because you're mirroring, you're reflecting upon the other person. Okay, and to be fair, there are more more things to be said. Like, like for instance, there, there are differences in in gender and emotional. Uh, capacity, you could say, detection of changes, emotional expressions, and, and the research is, is quite clear in this regard. The women uh, appear to have a greater emotional expression, more complex, okay, and also more skilled at detecting emotion in others. And, uh, and this might have some um, neurobiological and uh, evolutionary reason, okay, and um, it, it's also connected to the way we interact in, in society, all right? And, and the other thing that emotions are connected to is our ability to understand the truth as manifested outwardly, for instance, with polygraphs, right? These uh, um, machines that detect physiological arousal. So uh, how much can we fake a smile? And a fake smile, it's different uh, from a real one in the sense that the latter uses involuntary muscles more around the eyes. So it's, 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 it's hard to interpret because, for instance, very good actors are able to fake a smile and make it look very real, but overall, uh, there's a less uh, amount of muscles involved between the, the uh, true smiles and, and, the, and the fake smiles. And of course, facial expressions in regard to the, the, the gradient of expression vary among cultures, and this is the same for um, 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 the, the way we interact with the person in front of us, uh, maintaining eye contact, okay? 
Um, but the other interesting thing is that, that people blind from birth show the same facial expressions as sighted people, which this, it, it, it's an indication that it's largely innate, genetic, right? And, um, and it, it could also be connected to some evolutionary uh, components uh, to, to, um, to uh, emotions. And, uh, um, and another element is that in, in those studies, for instance, if you asked a subject to uh, hold a pen or a pencil um, in, in her mouth, that this will also impact the way the subject will interpret other things. So for instance, you put a, um, you as a subject to have a pencils in her mouth and you ask her to watch a movie and the person might find this movie, a comedy movie, more, uh, not necessarily interesting, but more uh, fun and hilarious than if those muscles were not artificially uh, triggered. Uh, so you can force someone into a smiling position and this person ends up feeling happier than the person whose this emotion were not uh, forced, which is again, it's connected to kind of fake it till you make it in a physiological sense. Um, but, but of course, this only leads to some outcomes, as we can see when we talk about uh, the physiological response in regard to uh, psychotherapy. And, and, and in, in connection to this, uh, there's another study by uh, another perspective of James Russell. Uh, this researcher sees our emotional experience in two dimensions across a diagram, from pleasant to unpleasant, or uh, from low to high arousal. Sorry, not or. You could, you could view this as uh, top pleasant, bottom unpleasant or negative, and then on the, on the horizon, low arousal and high arousal, and then this gives rise to different type of dimension. You, have, you feel relaxed, you feel enthusiastic, you feel sad or angry, which is uh, a modern interpretation of what we previous, previously said about um, the theory of humors, for instance, okay? And, um, and uh, this is connected to uh, a variety of things, such as you know the the, the adaptation uh, to uh, different circumstances, and 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 what uh, what other parameters can we say about the way we react to to stress? And since we mentioned stress, sorry, I've been talking a long time here. In the next slide, uh, this is what we talk about next. So, what what is stress, and how is this related to emotions? Well, straightforward, it can be physiological, biological, or psychological. And so we had to, since it's a reaction, you could say, to what extent is it something uh, observable? So a stressor is a chemical or biological agent, can be an external or an internal environmental condition or situation, as well as external or internal stimulus or an event causing stress to an organism. Okay? And the term stress comes from constrictor, so from Latin, something that squeezes us, constricts us, chokes us. And this gives a really good explanation also in, in metaphorical sense of the way we experience stress. How does it work in the next slide? Well, it works uh, via the stress response, as we will see here, the fight or flight response, hyper arousal, you see this term again, and then there is something that's more immediate as opposed to acute stress response. This is immediately fully connected to our immune system, our immune response mechanism. And psychoneuroimmunology, it's this holistic field connected to psychology that really discusses how our, our emotional states, our personalities, our interpretation of lives, our thoughts can make us more or less sick, okay? Now, in this little diagram here, we have a general overview that connects the immune system with two branches, the cellular and the humoral branch. And then you have T cells on one side and B cells on the other side. And you can see the, how they are attacked through different mechanisms, the uh, antigen there, okay? And then you have this macrophage, which is the first line of defense, okay? So it's, it's like having a, uh, an army in line and different mechanisms depend on a variety of things as we will see. So it's not something just philosophical, okay? It's something that occurs in a physiological sense. I mention this because, uh, not because f philosophy is not important, but when you talk about emotions and stress, you're talking about the same thing as you're talking about uh, other branches of medicine. Okay? It's really important to understand how studying psychology helps our physical health as well. Okay? Our emotional health for sure, our cognitive health for sure, but also uh, to a very big extent our, emo our physical health as well. So, 
what are the triggers to the stress response? We understand what stressors are as ingredients, but what, what, what are the triggers? Well, anything that happens in daily events, the stressful events, environmental stressors, uh, workplace stressor, chemical and social stressors. But I also want to point the finger to life crisis or changes, psychological changes, philosophical changes, spiritual changes and crisis, because you can literally get sick if you have a sick outlook in life. We mentioned that a few weeks ago, right? That feeling better also means to get better at feeling. And this is where everything comes together. You can make yourself sick if you have a sick feeling, a sick outlook, a sick interpretation of life. Okay? So what neuroanatomical and neurofunctional areas are involved in the stress response? Okay? Well, it's fundamental to understand how the nervous system works. And here you have another diagram. There's no reason to uh, review this. You should be able to remember that. But of course, uh, I would like to point the finger to, or rather point the finger, I would like to, uh, to stress, uh, pun intended, um, the role of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, arousal and calmness, okay? And another important thing to keep in mind is that the immune system in itself okay, is responsible for recognizing self from non-self. This is fundamental, one of the most important lessons in psychology. What does it mean? Well, understanding ourselves has a variety of direct applications. One, to understand our integration of self versus disintegration of self. If our identities are not fully developed and stable, we get sick. We are disintegrated. We can get disconnected, dissociated. If you remember those three layers, right, the three levels from cognitive distortions all the way to delusion, um, uh, psychotic uh, status as well as full dissociation, but also from a biological, physiological standpoint, if you understand the attack of a pathogen, of a virus, of bacteria, etc., the immune system should be able to recognize what is us, okay, ourselves with our internal state of affair, biologically speaking, from external or internal attacks, okay, like a virus, for instance, okay. So once you recognize that, you can decide, and I use this term with, with a, you know, with a uh, philosophical understanding, you need to decide there is a body intelligence to act upon that attack, to protect yourself, okay? And then you see that this is entirely connected to proper stress response versus improper stress response and chronic illnesses, which uh, will make us feel sick, in fact, more sick than we need, okay, sicker. What processes are involved specifically so that we don't only remain on a theoretical realm? First, the autonomic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, HPA. Please remember this by heart. Every time we talk about stress, think of the HPA, okay, the two major system, but also the S. AM, number two, the sympathoadrenal medullary axis, which might activate the fight or flight response through the sympathetic nervous system, which dedicates energy to more relevant bodily system to acute adaptation to stress. While the parasympathetic nervous system, as you probably already know, because it calms the system down, return the body to homeostasis, okay? So I learned is raising the red flag when needed, okay? Uh, what else? When an individual experiences a stressful event, the amygdala sends a distress signal to the hypothalamus, okay? So the fight and flight response is raising the alert and interpreting the problem, the stimulus, and sending information. This area of the brain communicates with the rest of the body through the autonomic nervous system, which controls such involuntary body function as breathing, blood pressure, heartbeat, and the dilation or constriction of key, key blood vessels and small airways in the lungs. Those are called bronchioles, or bronchioles, if you want to use the Latin pronunciation. What, what else? After the amygdala sends a distress signal, the hypothalamus, keep in mind the computer uh, metaphor we always use, uh, the hypothalamus activates the sympathetic nervous system by sending signals through the autonomic nerves to the adrenal glands. Keep 
those in mind, please. What are they doing? Well, they respond by pumping epinephrine, okay, or adrenaline, if you remember that, into the bloodstream. As epinephrine circulates through the body, it brings on a number of physiological changes. So think of this as this really bodily intelligence sending information throughout the body so the body is aware, the body is conscious of the fact that something needs to be done. And in this diagram, you can see where it happens, everything we just said, where it happens. And it is connected to, of course, hypothalamus and the pineal gland, right? And finally, the pituitary gland, the master gland, the thyroid, okay? And then adrenal glands, pancreas, and um, the, um, the, the, the thymus. I also included here uterus, ovaries, and testes because as part of the endocrine system, we need to understand how everything comes together. But let, let's, let's get even more, uh, even, even deeper into the, the, to what happens. So what is the immune system for? We already mentioned that, to protect and identify the self from the non-self, okay? What are the main structures? You have lymph nodes, okay, these bean-shaped spongy tissues, these lymph vessels, okay, these, which uh, um, connect uh, to lymph nodes and carry fluid, um, the lymph really into the bloodstream. And, and then you have leukocytes and lymphocytes. So in the first case, you have white blood cells and lymphocytes that are produced by bone marrow, T cells and B cells, as we have seen in the very first diagram, okay? And you can see here a little image of the lymph node structure. You can see the afferent lymphatic vessels, okay, and the afferent lymphatic vessel. If you remember the difference between afferent and afferent as from X or A, so to or from, okay, in Latin. Same, same uh, uh, prefixes here. Now, since we mentioned uh, the function of um, um, the HPA axis and SMA, in the next slide, I just want to add a few more uh, notes. So the adrenal glands are also known as suprarenal glands because they're right above the kidneys, right? Renal from Latin for kidney. There are endocrine gl glands that produce a variety of hormones, including adrenaline, as we just mentioned, and the steroid, adulterone, and cortisol. We mentioned cortisol because we mentioned the research on the stress response. So it's something you can study right away, physiologically speaking. You can observe it and calculate. The adrenal medulla is part of the adrenal gland and is the innermost part of the adrenal gland, okay? Now, keep in mind the connection between this and other parts of the nervous system. You should remember the difference between the medulla oblongata, right, and the cortex. Which one is closer to the center and which one it spreads out? The same applies to the adrenal um, uh, um, descriptor here. So, the medulla is the innermost part of the adrenal gland, consisting of cells that secrete epinephrine, norepinephrine, and a small amount of dopamine. And it is located at the center of the gland, okay, the medulla. But what is around it, it's surrounded by the adrenal cortex, just as the brain cortex, right? Which mediates the stress response through the production of mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids, classes of steroid hormones such as aldosterone and cortisol. Okay, so this is essential to understand the physiological response, okay? Where does it happen? In the next slide, you see a little diagram here, okay? And intuitively, you should already know this, right? The adrenal medulla inside is responsible for the short-term stress response, while the core is for the long-term stress response. It is as if there is an interpretation that, that keeps the stress response going on in the future, just as much as our cortical structures are more refined and determine who we are, right? So it's as if our system is telling itself, listen, you need to be stressed again because one never knows what's gonna happen in the future, okay? So the adrenal medal secretes epinephrine or epinephrine, adrenal cortex secretes steroid hormones, and you have a variety of physiological responses that I'll let you read on your own here, but it's, it's important to understand that there, the one is connected to the other so that the, the long-term stress response is built upon the short-term stress response. Is, it is as this, this mechanism is um, shared or propagated through time, okay? So I mentioned epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline multiple times, so I feel I should clarify a little uh, more, the similarities and differences. 
So norepinephrine or noradrenaline acts on alpha receptors in order to increase and maintain blood pressure. So noradrenaline is continuously released in the system, okay? So keep in mind, norepinephrine and noradrenaline, we're talking about the same thing. So it is structurally very similar to epinephrine or adrenaline, although the latter acts on multiple areas, so it has a broader range of effects, albeit it is secreted mostly during stressful moments. So there are both hormones and neurotransmitters, but adrenaline acts more like a hormone. And yet again, this is fascinating because it brings everything together, nervous system and endocrine system. All right. Uh, so after we experience stress, what happens? Uh, it, it's something that uh, it's, it's done and there's nothing else that happens again? Or, or, or can we talk about something that is a continuous interpretation? The latter is the correct answer. And yet again, I'm very passionate about this because studying stress, studying emotions, is really studying uh, the, the beginning, the causal factor for a lot of things we experience in life. Uh, to a very big extent, the reason why we keep being happy or keep being unhappy, it's really fundamental. Anyway, uh, you know, don't, don't mind me going on about these things. I'm, I'm very passionate about the, the, these things I teach. So anyway, as the initial surge of epinephrine subsides, okay, so there's this peak, right? The hypothalamus activates the second component of the stress response system, which is the HPA axis, which already right, con consisted of the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and the adrenal glands. What does the HPA axis do? It relies on a series of hormonal signals to keep the sympathetic nervous system pressed down. Okay, so this is where the metaphor <laughs> becomes very practical. If you, there was a quiz, if you remember what I asked you, um, to distinguish the, uh, the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? And the gas pedal is the metaphor that I used, um, that many use. And so if the brain continues to perceive something as dangerous or threatening, the hypothalamus releases corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRH, which travels to the pituitary gland and then triggers the release of the adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH. So this hormone travels to the adrenal glands, prompting them to release cortisol. The body that stays revved up and on high alert. When the threat passes, control level, cortisol level falls. The parasympathetic nervous system, the break them, dampens the stress response. But this is essential to understand why we feel stressed, why we feel unhappy, why we feel frustrated, and why so often we project our fears, our frustration elsewhere. We become so self-entitled, we point fingers out there, right? We, we become um, social justice warriors in the, in the worst uh, descriptor of the term, as in, we see dangers and threats everywhere, not realizing that while those dangers might be there, we should do something about it, we should have a social conversation about it, everything starts from within. We need to work on ourselves. We need to be able to understand when uh, being stressed enough is enough and does not provide any further information, any more social balance, any extra love or appreciation and only determines our downfall. We, it's not helpful, it makes us more sick, sick, it makes the social context, the world we live in more sick. It does not heal, the opposite is true, okay? So it's a very, very important to understand. Uh, in the next slide, another diagram, I will not repeat the whole thing, but it's kind of a, uh, a visual comparison between the um, SAM and the HPA. Um, and this is called the dual stress response because besides having this short-lived and long-term damage, you have this shock and counter-shock mechanism as well, all right? So um, the preparation for the fight or flight response is predicated upon, again, everything we said earlier about emotions. What comes first, the chicken and the egg problem, how we interpret the stress response, and the basic question, is this relevant? Should we carry on the uh, flame of stress? Maybe we should, and we should still be in alert to protect us from further damage, but we should also be understanding the fact that we need to train ourselves, notwithstanding what we perceive as threat, that there might not be threat waiting for us there. We should not be manifesting outwardly more danger than there really is, okay? And, and, and I mentioned this in the first part of this, this conversation today, 
when uh, you have to keep in mind that it's so easy, it's so easy for someone who's interested in solving a problem to make the problem subconsciously part of who they are. So a psychologist might see mental health issues everywhere the same way as a, you know, a firefighter might see fire where there's none, okay? There is a risk in enhancing, magnifying the dangers when there is uh, not the same level of threat, okay? All right, philosophical debates aside, how do we, we cope with stress? Uh, what does it mean to cope? Well, coping is best defined, at least in psychology, as the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional ways in which people manage stressful situations. It can be adaptive or maladaptive. It's closely related to how a given stressor is appraised, interpreted, right? And it's a goal-directed response in a managing stressful situations, okay? Now, if we compare this from a psychological perspective to what happens in the immune system, you have non-specific defense mechanisms and specific defense mechanisms. In the non-specific, you have the first line of defense and the second line of defense, which is really our identity. So the body has its identity, right? First line, the skin, membrane, etc. And then extended identity, you know, um, uh, uh, phagocytic white cells, antimicrobial proteins, and the inflammatory response is what we what we 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 manifest. And then the specific is the third line of defense. So just as we create our identity on psychological factors, on memories, on experiences, our body has an identity. This is also connected to what we said about the somatosensory map. If you remember the research that indicated that. If, um, um, if a primate is holding a stick, then the stick becomes an extension of their identity of the body. So it's the same thing for the immune system, all right? So we are not separate from others. This is the next slide, okay? So our emotional response is predicated on everything we said about conditioning, about physiological uh, states of affair, about emotions, about cognition, and uh, the way we interpret reality. Emotion focused coping, positive coping versus negative co coping involves seeking out others for social support, using alcohol to avoid thinking about a problem, or keeping busy to avoid thinking about a problem. Those are just three examples in three different areas. It's not the only ones, of course, but I just want to point uh, the fact that in the first case, you have more of a social dimension. You're, you're not expected to solve all the problems on your own. So you, you look for, for support, okay, for, for connection. And this is uh, what I say all the time. I will mention this next week as well. Borrowing someone else's mind or brain and borrowing someone else's heart. When, when things are too difficult, you trust others for their interpretation, brain, or their emotion, okay, heart. So you seek out others for social support. Or you try to cope by... Uh, numbing the, the emotion, the thoughts you have. I use alcohol here because it's widespread, but you can, you know, you can uh, think of marijuana, you can think of other drugs to avoid thinking about a problem or to lower the impact of the problem or simply try not to think about it, keeping busy. Okay? Now, all of this, the problem is that some of this might be working for a little while. Um, now, seeking out of others for social support is, is great. It's, it's also the one that has the least amount of, of side effects in comparison to the other two. But also, it might lead to over-reliance on others, over-dependence, codependence, and also uh, avoids the fact that you need to focus on yourself. You need to learn something on your own. You cannot only rely on others, okay? But the other two are extremely problematic because of the vast... Um, area of side effects that they represent. In the first case, alcohol is pretty straightforward. We mentioned uh, psychoneuroimmunology, we talk about psychopharmacology and, and diagnosis, so we don't have to spend too much time on it. But keeping busy, simply postponing the stress response, uh, uh, pretending that the issue is not there, okay? Emotion-focused coping means to psychologically distancing oneself from a stressor. And you need to maintain proper distance, okay? And this has also to do with social cultural factors. In the US, uh, people tend to distance oneself far too often from social support they might otherwise have from their families, assuming their families are nurturing families or, or their close circle of friends, and they might rely on overworking, for instance. In other sociocultural areas, 
there might be more of a connection with families. And, and by the way, there was a lot of studies and still present where uh, in regard to personality and stressors, the more connected a person was to their social uh, group, their family, their um, cultural, ethno-religious group, the healthier outcomes uh, they had. And this is consistently so true. So just something to keep in mind. All right, let's continue. Um, we mentioned stress in general, and I also want to mention a few things about um, specific issues or problems or syndromes. Uh, GAS, it's one of them, general adaptation syndrome. And it's really um, easy to remember because you, you go from the sympathetic nervous system, gas pedal, and gas reminds you of general adaptation syndrome. This was identified by Hans Selye, the psychologist. And it's pretty much describing this curve. So our stress response system defends and then fatigues, okay? So the body goes through uh, different stages. Alarm, first stage, uh, resistance, second stage, and exhaustion, uh, third stage. So in the first phase, okay, there's a stressor, okay, and you can see here you go from low to high stress resistance. So you have this waving, sounding alarm, okay, so mobilizing resources. And then you have the second phase, which is the, the coping part, okay, the body resistance to stress, which can only last so long before exhaustion sets in, and then you have exhaustion, okay which is really a part of this discussion on, um, how can I say this, on um, um, this resiliency model as well, which we discussed in regard to depression. All right, so in the, in the long run, so how, how else can we interpret that in terms of this, this fatigue and this exhaustion? Is this also connected to immune response? Yes, the answer will be yes. And um, there are a few terms here that I just want to mention. Um, you have this innate immunity, okay, invariant early limited specificity, the first line of defense. We already mentioned that. Also called non-specific. Then you have the adaptive immunity, also called specific, with the T cells and B cells. But in terms of the important concepts that I want you to remember is that you have uh, humoral immunity, immunological immunity, and immune and autoimmune disorders. I will add a slide that, uh, sorry, a, um, a, a lecture that discusses the connection between uh, the immune system and disorders, more, more from a medical perspective rather than just a psychological perspective. And by just, I don't mean lower than, I simply mean more specific, okay? Uh, but this is simply to say that studying the psychology of, of emotions is really connected to studying health in general. We should never fully separate mental health from uh, physical health, okay? So, so but what, what are the, 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 the link between going from a stress response to getting sick, okay? Well, first of all, every person is different, okay? So we, we, we differ at the patterns and frequency of stressor to which we are exposed, okay? Some of us may be better uh, off in terms of what kind of uh, work line they're involved in, what kind of lifestyle they have. So this variation determines the, the, the frequency and the magnitude with which we turn uh, on the stress response um, and whether the stress response occurs uh, over time, okay? And then the same magnitude and frequency of the stress response will regulate immune um, um, competence that, for instance, if you think about the glucocorticoids, and the level of immune competence determine susceptibility of a disease, right? So to a disease. So we can make ourselves sick in the sense that stress will impair your immune function, okay? So direct sympathetic nervous system and hormones and indirect in terms of overall philosophy of life, lifestyle, coping mechanism, spirituality, religion, et cetera, et cetera. Now, something that will connect us to what we will discuss next week is personality factors, okay? Now, uh, we mentioned this a few times. You have uh, cluster A, B, and C personality disorders, type A versus type B personality, um, and you have multiple um, uh, uh, personality tests, the big five, which we will discuss more in depth next week. But in general, certain types of personalities are more or less linked with disorders, and by disorder, I mean getting sick also physically. So, few terms, 
Hardiness, okay? One of the factors. Hardiness, cluster of stress buffering traits consisting of commitment, challenge, and control. Hardiness, okay? It's linked to lower level of anxiety, okay? So, and uh, it, it's, it, it also means that you get less sick. Hardy people are more likely to engage in positive reappraisal of stressful events. So your interpretation is making you healthier. You don't try to remove the stressor altogether, per se. You consider part of the challenge, okay? And, and this, yet again, connects to sociological factors, okay? You're not trying to make a better world by removing all the things that go wrong. You interpret them as challenges that you can play a part in to ameliorate yourself first before you point finger at others, but also to monitor your level of anxiety depending on what this lesson is really telling you, okay? And this is connected to being um, um, optimistic about something, okay? So uh, the, 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 the optimism and uh, proper function of the immune system are directly uh, correlated. So the more optimist you are, which doesn't mean that you need to be smiling and happy all the time. It's a common misconception. Optimism in the sense of optimizing your interpretation events, not just pretend that everything is happy-go-lucky and you don't have anything to worry about. No, you need to worry about certain things, but then you have an option. Either you act upon that, you try to solve the problem, you ask for help, you try to uh, take a step back and, and look at the bigger picture, or you avoid the problem, but usually that doesn't really go uh, well because you just postpone a stress response, and avoiding working yourself means pointing the finger at others rather than focusing on yourself. Which brings us to uh, LOCI or uh, LOCI, LOCUSES, which is the next uh, slide. LOCUS in Latin means place, location, okay? Space, state of affairs, okay? Um, more specifically, LOCUS of control and LOCUS of responsibility. Please take a break if you need, get some water. This is also important, very important in a course in psychology. So let me take a sip of water here. because it really um, helps us being uh, self-nurturing, kind, uh, inclusive, able to listen to emotion and thought, but also taking responsibility for the way we go about life. So uh, let's try to do this in a meditative state of mind. Let's take a deep breath in and out and, uh, and see what, what this has to do with uh, um, this lecture on stress, emotion, addiction, um, and eventually personality, which is the bridge to next lecture. Few authors, Thomas Aquinas, Rudolf Allers, Julian Rotter, Bernard Weiner, and then you have another concept connected to this uh, uh, locus of control and locus of responsibility, the concept of attributional style or explanatory style. Lynn Yvonne Abramson, Martin Seligman, and John Teasdale. There are so many researchers, so please consider this just an introductory list, okay? But um, they are essential. Now, you might wonder, okay, I might have heard of Seligman, I might have heard of Rotter, uh, I don't know about others, um, and I don't understand what Thomas Aquinas has to do with all of this. Well, to answer the first question, Rudolf Allers is one of the most important Austrian uh, researchers, psychiatrists uh, ever. He uh, was one of the harshest critics of, uh, of Freudian psychoanalysis without getting on the opposite side of the extremist, uh, materialistic uh, um, uh, side of the spectrum. Uh, but he definitely added a profoundly scientific as well as spiritual, I mean, a religious dimension to how we understand our responsibility as human people, okay? So I really encourage you to uh, read anything you can get on your hands on about Rudolf Allers, a phenomenal researcher. And then Aquinas, let's, let's talk about Aquinas in the, in the next slide. So Aquinas is mostly uh, renowned as um, a theologian, as one of the last classic philosophers, but um, I must say that I have to admit my bias. He is probably the most important psychologist, uh, at least in the modern world, that ever lived. To the point that I mention this all the time: if you study Aquinas long enough, you will 
you I won't say that you will not need anything else after him, but you realize how so much of current neuroscientifically informed psychological studies really reflect something that he wrote um, in the Middle Ages. So in regard to stress response and taking responsibility, what, what, what has it to say? Uh, this is a super summary. He understands the freedom of our free choices to be a reality as primary and metaphysically and conceptually reducible as the reality of physical laws. And he puts all his reflections on morality and practical reason under the heading of mastery over one's own acts. Mastery over one's own acts. Acts. More specifically, the morality of a human act may be broken down into three primary components. The actor's intentions, the moral object involved, and the surrounding circumstances. Now, a few clarification here. First of all, by morality, we also mean, uh, in, in the context of uh, locus of control and locus of responsibility, acting in a moral sense. Don't think of it as moralizing, okay? but the correct choice, the correct ethical choice, okay? The freedom of making the best decision for our lives, okay? And the best decision for our lives also does mean that you don't have to uh, fight against another life either, okay? We have this very false, scientifically disproven entirely idea of the survival of the fittest. Absolutely nonsense from the perspective of ethology. Careful here. What I'm saying is not that evolutionary biology is incorrect, okay? Not in that sense. But the idea that in social um, factors, the stronger gorilla who acts as the, 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 the bully and, and, and makes fun of everybody and beats up everyone is the one that will succeed. Over and over and over again, all the studies indicate that it's not the case. Yes, proudness, physical force, establishing yourself as the alpha, you know, um, um, chief in a specific group of, um, of mammals, in this case, of, of primates, makes for a great start. But unless you're willing to take care of the group and you display correct ethical uh, manifestations, then you'll be taken down. So it's a false idea that... Uh, you need to be the strongest and be ready to face off all the other people that will throw you under the bus. This is actually causing you stress. Life, it's not a battle only. It sure is a battle in a profoundly um, philosophical, psychological, and spiritual self, but not in a sense that you always need to be suspicious of others because otherwise someone else will take you down. It's a really unhealthy way to go about life. The world is not made up of people that are out to get you. The world is not made up of, of corrupt individuals, institutions, etc. that will corrupt the world. Okay? There is that too, but in many cases, people that get in a certain position of authority deserve to be there. They did not reach that goal only due to corruption. Please, please try to revise uh, your, your outlook if that's how you go about life. It's really making you more miserable, and it's also not the truth. And that's what Kwanan means by mastery over one's own acts, okay? It's really also connected to Buddhism, right? The separation of emotions that are strong, but that are not illuminated, are not um, awakening yourself, they're not enlightening you, right? You master yourself first. Once you master yourself, then you can understand the world, and that's what we understand under the actor's in intention, not actor as in Hollywood, but actor as the person acting, the subject, okay? You, your intention, what you are approaching, okay? What, how you exercising your, your free will, your control, your emotional response to the moral object, and then of course the surrounding circumstances, how free you are. Are you free to choose what's good for you or under, are you under some sort of pressure, okay? So this is Aquinas. Now, if we want to take a look at the other perspectives here, you can have this diagram here where you have different ways to go about, uh, about the world, okay? So locus of control and locus of responsibility as in how much control you think you have and how much uh, responsibility you have over the things that happen to you, okay? Internal, if you feel everything is about you, not in a, in a 
in a narcissistic sense, but everything is your, uh, it's caused by your action and your thoughts, external versus external if you, if you think that everything depends on the external factors, social circumstances of others, okay? That's what we mean by locus of control and locus of responsibility, okay? So in the next slide you have responsible on top and not responsible on the bottom, on the left, not responsible on the right, responsible. So you, if you have your emotions and you're responsible, okay, you are toward mature, okay? You, you're responsible for, for uh, your emotions, okay? but you're not responsible for others' emotions, okay? You work on yourself, not on the emotions of others. You're mature, okay? And it's interesting because you're mature in a healthy way because on the opposite side, you're too responsible for your own emotions, but you're also responsible for others' emotions. You concern yourself about whatever emotion the other person displays. You're consumed by understanding what other people are feeling about you especially, right? You're, you're, you're constantly in fear of either displeasing others, disappointing others, or not being at the center of attention of others, right? So you become a martyr, okay? You remember what we said about um, narcissistic traits and borderline, right? Um, so you're mature, but only to uh, the level of balance. In Latin, interesting enough, you are an adult, okay? Because if you're too adult, you become not adultus, adult, but adulterer, okay? Adulterior in Latin. And adultery is a sin by definition. You become too involved, okay? You become uh, less focused on the proper balance between this responsibility. Now, if you go to the third diagram, bottom left, infantile, right? Because you're not responsible for your emotion or others. You completely detach from that, okay? You're, you're detached in a sense that you don't think you're responsible for anything. And then the uh, fourth quadrant, uh, bottom right, you're manipulative, okay? You're responsible for others' emotions, but you're not really responsible for your own your emotions. Very, very interesting how, how this plans out to be, okay? Entirely predict predicted by Aquinas. In the next slide, I'll give you some examples here, okay? First, let's take a look at the internal and external locus of control. If you have an internal locus of control, you take responsibility for your own actions. You're less influenced by the opinions of others. You work hard to achieve the things they want. Or, sorry, you want, my apologies. Uh, you feel confident in the face of challenges, okay? Because you, you interpret challenges as learning opportunities. And you report being happier and more independent, okay? okay? Not that being dependent in itself is a bad thing, okay? And it's a cultural thing. In, in, as I mentioned, in individualistic cultures, uh, we play far too much emphasis on independency, as if that's the only good thing. Despite the fact that research is clear that if you have a healthy dependency of uh, your family, social circle of friends, you're much healthier. Okay, it's not about detaching yourself, separating yourself from others, having a proper distance, right? And then on the opposite side, external locus of control. Blame outside forces for their circumstances. Credit luck or change for any success. Uh, and we talked about the etymology of luck in depth, so I will skip it for now. But it's pretty, pretty interesting, right? How how luck is connected to the, this this very metaphysical structure. What luck actually is. Third, don't believe they can change the situation through their efforts. So what's the point? Okay, and feeling hopeless or powerless in the face of difficult situation. It's the essence of learn helplessness. If you have full external locus of control, you blame everything by yourself. You're, you think you're involved in social justice and changing the world, but you end up feeling more hopeless, okay? And you're more prone to experiencing learn helplessness in a depression a sense of the term. Now, here you have uh, the same uh, diagram in a more uh, uh, the correct sense, on top of locus of control, and on the left side, locus of responsibility, internal, external on top, internal person, uh, left, external system, right? And I see it stands for internal uh, control, internal responsibility. Uh, I see internal control, external responsibility, bottom right, sorry, bottom left, uh, external control, internal responsibility, and bottom uh, la uh, right, external control, external responsibility. So you have all these uh, types of ways to exist in the world. Okay, so if, for instance, let's say, if you have an internal locus of control and responsibility, you're, you're determined, you take action, uh, you take matters in your own hand. 
if you have an internal um, control, but external responsibility it simply means that you 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 do everything you can, but you also don't expect everything to be under your responsibility. There are certain factors that you could not account for. For instance, you're a first generation American. You study hard and you, you still did not get an A in the in the quiz, you also need to understand that you might have misinterpreted external factors such as, I don't know, um, uh, idioms for it, idiomatic expressions that you might not have fully understood. So yes, it is part of your responsibility to study more, but it's also certain things that you could not have envisioned, for instance, right? Or doesn't matter if you moved here um, from, I don't know, a war zone and you were previously working as a nuclear engineer here you can only work as, I don't know, a janitor or something like that. You have internal control, you, have, you value what you're doing, you're, you're not blaming anything else, but you also need to understand that there are external factors that might play a role in the fact that you could not climb the ladder the same way as in the country where you came from. Okay? And again, th th there's a blurry lines because some of this should be considered external. For instance, there are circumstances with racism or, 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 or sexism or, or, or hate are responsible for the fact that there is not a fair share of accessibility to, let's say, services, for instance, okay, or very problematic structure in the system itself. And think about universal healthcare versus uh, pay for healthcare, the very poor situation we are in in this country. But then there are also things where you should really be able to separate um, the, the accessibility in itself and the differences in terms of uh, equality of uh, outcomes as opposed to equality of opportunities. We are not the same in this sense. So this is a really good way to understand how to modulate our sense of self. The last two quadrants, you know, mention external control, uh, internal responsibility. Uh, you yield to everything else outside. You're, you're not in control uh, because your external circumstances um, cannot make you uh, be successful, but you blame yourself because you're responsible for everything inside. And then external control, external responsibility, you're, you're, you don't blame anything on yourself, but you also yield all types of control. All right. So um, this is really um, interesting because uh, we have different ways to approach that in different types of um, psychotherapeutic strategies. Now, in this lecture, I will only mention them to just have you familiarize with the acronyms, but we'll dig uh, deeper into this uh, next week when we talk about personality and psychotherapy. So a few acronyms that we use in psychotherapy to address things such as stress and strong emotions and psychological disorder, depression, etc., etc. ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, directly linked to what we just said about locus of control and locus of responsibility. CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, we mentioned it, kind of tried a few times already in the semester. So thoughts, emotions, and actions. So cognition, um, um, uh, feelings, and um, um, behavior, right? CFT, compassion, compassion focus therapy. Uh, keep in mind what we said about compassion and sympathy, etymologically speaking. DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, is the uh, major opus, the work by Marsha Linehan especially regarding um, uh, mood disorders, personality traits, uh, uh, cluster B, borderline, etc., etc. Very, very uh, useful. REBT, one of the precursors, right? Rational emotive behavioral therapy. And there are many others, but for now, I just want you to familiarize with this as strategies to, uh, to uh, make us feel, if not better, at least, I don't know, more, more in tune with, uh, with ourselves and uh, better understand who we are. So in the next slide, the question is, are there differences in the application of therapies for stress? Okay, Is, is any, any therapy kind of the same? Are they more subjective? Should we, what, what should we say about that? Physiologically, men and women differ in how they cope with stress in each of the following ways. And this is a really solid research uh, corroborated by decades of uh, repetition and validation, okay? Men display greater stress-induced secretion of catecholamines. Men also exhibit higher blood pressure reactivity immediately after stress. Women instead exhibit a stronger glucocorticoid response to stress than men. 
women respond to antigens more strongly than men. Estrogen, in this sense, may affect the development or function of immune cells, and this may explain why more women develop autoimmune diseases. Okay? Straight, uh, forward, solid science here. Ignoring this is extremely detrimental to the health of the subjects, the patients, the clients we treat, and it should not be uh, ignored. Extremely important. Now, of course, it's not all there is, because I've mentioned here, gender differences in coping styles are diminished in research studies when women and men of similar socioeconomic styles are compared. So gender is not everything, okay? And there are so many other things, and of course, it's always nature and nurture. Furthermore, uh, in general, women are so much better than men in asking for help, at least psychological help, but also medical help. And, and this is more uh, true in the West, especially in the United States and elsewhere. But this might also be a, a, um, an indication of why we have higher rates of these disordered women, simply because they ask for help, and so they might be overrepresented in the data. And the downside is that for men, they wait far too long before they ask for help, maybe because they want to display a stronger sense of self, they don't want to be seen as weak, there might be a variety of reasons, but they also might forfeit their ability to get help. So there's a lot of factors, social factors, uh, um, genetic factors, uh, educational factors, nature, nurture, etc., etc. Uh, other aspects to bring everything together here, two more slides. Uh, to go back to the basic here. So problem-focused coping is a coping strategy focused on dealing directly with a stressor, with a problem, in which we either reduce the stressor demands okay, or increase our resources for meeting its demands. This is connected to the study by Mikhail Krzyzewski in regarding to the flow. Okay? People of low socioeconomic status tend to rely less on problem-focused coping than do people with more education and higher incomes which seems to be a catch-22. The more you know about life, the more access you have to resources about life, the better off you are in turning the issue. And this is another thing that the research is pretty indicative, that the blame game does not really work, and it's not really presenting the truth. Okay? Of course, some people are not there, and by that I mean they don't have education or higher incomes for things that are not uh, ethically justifiable, okay? They might be dispossessed, they might have had abuse, they might have uh, encountered um, um, racism, or, or, uh, or um, they might be prevented from um, having accessibility to care because of the system, whatever the case. So the start might be different, okay? But focusing on the issue is extremely important because the more you do, the more you get, okay, in that sense. Uh, and also, the more it's demanded from you, with great power comes great responsibility. This is also something you can find in, in a philosophical and theological context, right? The more you've been given as a gift, the more responsibility you have to use the gift. So you cannot take your uh, smarts lightly or your, your kindness lightly. You need to put it to use, okay? So, and to connect this to what we said earlier, that this is going to hardiness again, the problem focused coping, because the three traits of hardy people, people capable of enduring stress in the form of fatigue, hardship, exposure, etc., are control, think of what we said about internal and external, challenge, okay, rather than thinking of it as, as a, as a uh, curse or a, as, a, as a conspiracy against you, it's a challenge, okay, and commitment, okay. All right, very last slide. A key factor in promoting the ability of some children because we had to look at this from the developmental perspective, okay? You're an adult now, and so uh, you, you're, or you're, you're, you're getting there. <laughs> so you know a lot of things that children don't know, but you also carry the burden in positive or negative uh, uh, terms of everything you've been exposed to so far. So you need to think of how children become adolescent adults, what, what, what baggage they carry on. So a key factor for the, the ability of some children to bounce back from environmental stress or that might otherwise disrupt their development, psychologically, etc., is having well-developed elements of social cognition and perceiving strong social support from at least one other person. And this is why uh, observing behavior, having good role models, healthy role models, okay, as opposed to ideologies and 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 harsh judgment, is so important. So values principles, ethics, strategies, examples, okay? You need to display, it's not, it's not enough to 
keep everything in theory, you know, you, you need to lead by example. Okay? It's, 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 it's essential. It's what we said about um, uh, Albert Bandura and the Bonobo dolls, and what we said about uh, sociocognitive theory and, uh, and uh, Vygotsky with the social proximal development, right? And then philosophy of life. So all the things play a role in, uh, in the way we interpret our stress response, but also our emotions, uh, our sense of self, and how this can solve uh, problems in terms of how can we uh, be liberated for all the things that keep us prisoners of ourselves. I think we can conclude here. This is the last research studies that I want you to uh, remember, or at least to uh, be exposed to as part of module 10. I hope that uh, we had enough time to discuss emotion, addiction, uh, the stress response and overall health perspective this week. As I mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of things that we need to cover, but at this point, you are in a good shape around week 10 to understand the physiology, the psychological factors, the theories, the more specific scientific underpinnings of behavior, cognition, and emotion. Think about neurotransmitters. Uh, neuroreceptor, the whole chemistry, that I feel you are all ready to embark on a new chapter in this semester. Beside the diagnostic factor that we uh, briefly discussed in week seven and eight, next week we will be talking about personality um, as well as psychotherapy. The assumption is that while we understand that nature and nurture both play a role in the way we feel, we need to understand what makes us who we are in terms of personality in general, but also what can we do in practice from a clinical perspective to help our own life and the life of the people we live with, we interact with, and we treat if you're embarking on a therapeutic uh, career. Thank you very much. I will see you all in week 11. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Bye-bye.